Molly here. I wanted to thank everyone who has subscribed to our channel. I put a call out last week for people to subscribe to help us get to the thousand subscriber mark so that we can apply for monetization. And we've actually gotten more people than I had thought that we would. <laughs> I want everyone to know how much I really appreciate you guys subscribing to our channel. And if there are any other small channels out there who are struggling to hit that thousand subscribers, put your channel in the comments below so that we can go ahead and subscribe to you. And maybe some other people who subscribe to this channel might do so as well. Thank you. This week, we are talking about Gene Roddenberry's Earth Final Conflict. The first episode aired October 6th, 1997. The series was developed and produced thanks to Majel Barrett, Gene Roddenberry's widow, and was based on notes that Gene Roddenberry had made before he died. The show ran for five seasons, but I personally only recommend season one. I will explain why in the review portion, so just sit tight through the recap for that. First, let's go ahead and recap how this series began. We open with a crowd of people waiting to greet an extraterrestrial. This event is being sponsored by a company called Doors International. Security for the event is being handled by police captain William Boone. Boone is irritated that many of his recommendations for securing the event have been ignored, and he demands to know who was responsible for scaling back his security precautions. An FBI agent assigned to the protection of the Talons, who are also referred to as the Companions, introduces himself to Boone as Agent Ronald Sandoval. And he informs Boone that the companion, Da'an, himself had mandated the changes. Da'an did not want a barrier between himself and the people. Boone is surprised by the pronoun he. Sandoval replies, he, she, neither really applies. Boone is annoyed and tells Sandoval, you can tell him that next time he's looking for someone to run security, don't call me. Sandoval tells Boone that Boone can tell Da'an himself, because Da'an wants to meet Boone after the event. At this point, Boone notices something odd on Sandoval's arm and asks him what it is. Sandoval simply states, the companion is here. A red carpet is rolled out and a band plays as a sound like thunder erupts and the companion's ship appears in the sky, having just traveled 1,500 miles in four minutes. First out of the ship is the pilot, a human by the name of Lily Marquette. Then the crowd gets their first glimpse of the companion. Da'an is tall, bald, and androgynous. For a moment, Da'an appears to shimmer, and it's easy to see that this creature is made of energy and not flesh. As Da'an is walking to the stage, the scene cuts to a building across the plaza, where an assassin is setting up his equipment. Da'an shakes the hand of Jonathan Doors, the man behind Doors International, and then continues to the podium. Da'an greets the crowd in the Talon language, which sounds like something akin to the language of snakes or demons. In English, Da'an tells the crowd that when the Talon arrived on Earth, they felt the pain of humans who were without basic sustenance, and that farmers have applied Talon science to ensure that every child would have a full stomach. He goes on to talk about Talon help with medicine, and how the humans have greeted the Talon with open arms and warm hearts when they could have greeted them with fear and misgiving. The Talon are partnering with Jonathan Doors to usher in a new era for humankind. Doors takes the podium to announce the new partnership, and Boone notices a red dot on Da'an's chest. He shouts for everyone to get down. Jonathan Doors jumps in front of Da'an and takes a bullet in his back. In the ensuing chaos, Lily Marquette attends to Doors. The police run toward the building from which the shot had been fired, and Sandoval aims the thing on his arm at the room where the assassin had been. All the way across the plaza, Sandoval fires the thing on his arm, and what appears to be an energy ball flies through the sky and does significant damage to the building across the way. The shooter wasn't injured and flees the scene, but not before Boone catches up to him and realizes the shooter is a man named Eddie, who had been best man at Boone's wedding. Back at the scene of the shooting, it appears that Jonathan Doors didn't make it. Interestingly, Boone keeps his encounter with Eddie to himself and says that when they catch the guy, Boone wants to talk to the shooter alone before anyone else is notified. Da'an requests to see Boone and thanks Boone for what he did. Boone expresses doubt that Jonathan Doors would feel the same. Da'an wants Boone to work for the companions, but Boone turns him down. Boone and his wife are getting ready to start a family, and that's where his priority was going to stay. 
Da'an says he respects Boone's decision, but expressed a hope that the future would offer Boone a chance to reconsider. The next scene cuts to the shooter, sitting in an empty bar. Lily Marquette walks in and demands to know what happened. Eddie tells her that doing this in Boone's jurisdiction was a mistake. Lily says that doesn't matter anymore, and tells Eddie that Da'an and Sandoval tried to recruit Boone, and that Boone could be the one. Boone's wife arrives at the station to see him, and Boone tells her that it was Eddie who shot Doors. Shocked, Boone's wife insists Eddie is not a killer. Boone then relays that the companions offered him a job, and he turned them down. His wife is a bit incensed that he turned down the job without discussing it with her, but the situation is diffused when Boone says that he told them no because they're starting a family. His wife says they could start a family anywhere, and she doesn't understand his mistrust of the companions. He tells her he doesn't trust anyone or anything whose motivations are unknown, and he never will. She asks him, why can't you just trust? As it turns out, she should have been a little less trusting because Boone's wife gets murdered in the very next scene. In the days following his wife's death, Boone is once again summoned by Da'an. Boone agrees to the meeting, and Lily flies Boone to Washington, D.C. Da'an expresses his condolences to Boone, and Boone explains that he is there to hear out Da'an because it's what his wife would have wanted. Da'an asks Boone about his concerns, and Boone gets straight to the point, asking Da'an flat out, Why have the Talons come to Earth? Da'an explains that humanity is at an evolutionary crossroads, and observing humanity will help the Talon face their own evolutionary future. The job offered to Boone is Commander of Security and Interspecies Relations. Sandoval tells Boone there is another inducement. Sandoval has an implant in his brain, a cyber virus, or CVI, half computer chip, half Talon germ. Not only does the CVI increase basic intelligence, but it actually puts you right in your memory. Boone would never be without his wife again. Boone's expression changes, and it's obvious that Sandoval's manipulation has hit its mark. Boone tells Da'an he'll think about the offer. Boone gets in the ship to return home, and Lily tells him there's one more person Boone has to see. Boone agrees to go. The bar we saw earlier is now filled with people. In a back room, Boone discovers Eddie waiting for him. Boone embraces Eddie, but then asks him when he became a killer. Eddie tells Boone that things are not what they seem, and it's revealed that Jonathan Doors is very much alive. Doors faked his death as part of a larger plan to discover the Talon's true motives. Boone isn't impressed, and tells the group that he'll figure out the answers on his own. Doors tells Boone he should start with his wife. This gets Boone's attention, and Doors tells him that the companions killed Kate. Eddie points out that Boone turned down the companions' offer, and Kate was killed that night. Two days later, he was given the offer again. Boone decides to listen. Dr. Bellman tells Boone she's sure Da'an didn't tell him everything about the CVI, that there's a built-in imperative to serve the companions above all else. But she's re-engineered the cybervirus to remove the imperative, but they can't be sure she was successful until the altered CVI is implanted. Boone would be admitted to the Companion's inner circle, and the Companion's would be none the wiser. Boone agrees under two conditions. Number one, Kate's murderer is his. Number two, if the CVI doesn't function as planned, he wants Eddie to kill him. Boone undergoes the procedure and is implanted with the altered CVI. It appears that the doctor's efforts to remove the imperative have been successful. Da'an and Sandoval are pleased, and assign Lily as Boone's second-in-command. Boone is then issued a skrill, which was the thing Sandoval has attached to his arm that he used as a weapon at the beginning of the episode. Boone is then summoned back to the police department, because Eddie has been found dead. Boone isn't happy that Doors couldn't protect Eddie, and tells Lily he doesn't trust Doors. The episode ends with Boone leaving an orchid on Kate's grave. The end. Now, if you don't want spoilers as to who killed Kate. That's revealed in episode two, and I'm going to go ahead and talk about that. In fact, the rest of our review will mention this. So if you do not want to know, you don't want that spoiled, you want to watch for yourself, end watching this video right now. Otherwise, be prepared, I'm about to spoil that. In the second episode, Boone uses his new CVI to go back in his memory, and he remembers details about the night Kate died. Using this trail, he is able to track down the assassin who killed his wife, which eventually leads him back to none other than 
Sandoval. Because of the CVI, Sandoval saw it as his imperative to make sure that the companions got what they wanted, and that was Boone. And the thing standing in the way of that was Boone's wife. Because Boone does not want to reveal that his CVI has been altered, he cannot react to this news in any way other than how Sandoval has done already. That it was good that his wife is no longer an obstacle to his service of the companions. We also learn that Sandoval, he did not kill his own wife, and he regrets this because she's currently locked up in a mental institution. We then skip ahead to episode 12. There are episodes in between, which do add to the story, but I'm skipping ahead to 12 because in episode 12, we learn more about Ronald Sandoval. In that episode, Sandoval's CVI begins to fail. And when this happens, the imperative to serve the companions, well, that goes out the window and Sandoval's emotions return, including those for his wife. And he is deeply sorry and regretful for what he has done to her, placing her in a mental institution. He goes to the institution and breaks her out and he is trying to find ironically, Boone and Dor's group so that he can trade information for his wife's safety. Because Sandoval is very much aware that when his CVI disintegrates, that he is going to die. Boone has been ordered to eliminate Sandoval, but instead of doing so, he tells Sandoval that he can help him hide his wife. And they do hide his wife, but then Boone takes Sandoval to be re-implanted with a new CVI. And right as Sandoval is about to be re-implanted, Boone tells Sandoval that he has done for him what Sandoval once did for Boone. And Sandoval is very distressed by this. However, we the audience see that Sandoval's wife is behind glass watching the whole procedure, so she is very much alive. At the end of this episode, we see that Sandoval is wearing his wife's wedding ring on his pinky finger. And I'm not really sure exactly what that was supposed to mean, that maybe this new CVI wasn't as effective as the original. I'm not sure. Because one would think that if it was like the original CVI, that that wouldn't be a thing, that he wouldn't be wearing his wife's wedding ring. I do know that watching that episode certainly made me feel bad for that character because previously he had been basically written as a psychopath who put the companions above all else, obviously, since he had Boone's wife murdered. And this episode, episode 12, fleshed out his character in a way that made you actually have sympathy for him. So that was actually really well done. To build on last week, this was one of two series that in the 90s, early 2000s, Majel Barrett got developed from older Gene Roddenberry ideas. So for me, this series, I enjoyed season one quite a bit. This first season for me is up there with the rest of the stuff that I enjoyed in the 90s. However, and I mean no disrespect to people who disagree with this, but this series I have fairly strong feelings as far as what they did to it. So if you enjoyed the following seasons, power to you. But I despised from the first episode of season two what they did to this series. First of all, they removed the Boone character at the end of season one. And they introduced this hybrid space baby that grew up in the course of, I don't know, a few days. I don't know exactly what happened behind the scenes, but this was horrible. As much as I enjoyed season one, and I enjoyed it a lot, and I'll go into that in a little bit on what I enjoyed, season two and on insulted my intelligence almost every single week. Like Star Trek Discovery insult my intelligence. So if we're talking season two and beyond, I despise Earth Final Conflict. If we're talking season one, I really, really, really enjoyed this. In fact, I treat season one as a completely different series from what came afterwards. I would agree with that. For me, what I found interesting about season one was a lot of different things. The concepts of what they were doing with the Talons as far as they had this group connection with each other, this commonality. I don't remember, I'm trying to think of the term they used, it might have been called the commonality, or it was something like that, where they were basically connected, their thoughts, kind of like the Borg are in the Star Trek 
series. And the way they handled that, because these creatures, although they looked like they were humanoid when they were dealing with humans, when you saw them in private, they were taking on this like energy form. So their natural state was some sort of energy form. And they just kept introducing little things about this world that I just found fascinating, especially when it was this came out in the late 90s. It kind of had a cyberpunky feel to some of it when it was exploring concepts of self and free will and, I guess, loss, overcoming challenges. To me, what I enjoyed were there were some characters and performances in this series that I just remember quite well. Like, for instance, to me, the interaction between Boone and Da'an was the highlight of this series. Boone being a representative of humankind, and Da'an... Da'an was kind of like a, I guess, a more understanding entity of the Talon race as far as human beings, because when we do see other Talons, they seem to kind of look at human beings as kind of, I mean, not maybe not as bad as cattle, but like something very... Beneath them. Yes. Whereas Da'an was trying to look at humankind as some, maybe a bit primitive in some of their ideas, but on the same plane as far as this is a sentient race that I think we can learn from each other. Da'an's performance, the actress who played Da'an was Lenny Parker, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing her first name correctly. It's L-E-N-I. I I think that's Lenny. Could be Lenai. I I don't know, but I'm going to call her Lenny Parker. And she had a very subtle performance that I really appreciated. It's hard to explain You have to watch the performance because when I think of like the 90s, when I think of the science fiction series that had people with prosthetics on that we all remember as being great actors when it came to conveying stuff, when I think of Deep Space Nine's Garrick, the actor was Andrew Robinson, Garrick was a very, very, very interesting character. His performances were captivating. When he was in a scene, he drew everybody to watch that scene. And in Babylon 5, Andreas Kasulis, who played Jakar, he carried the scene himself when he was on camera. He had that sort of presence. And through all that makeup, that's just really telling how great of a character actor they must have been, or currently are, that they could get through that makeup and actually do a performance. And I think Lenny Parker is actually on the same level as the two I just mentioned. She has a more subtle performance, but the way she conveyed things, not so much with emotional outbursts, but subtle head movements, eye gestures, because the interesting part of the Talons when they were being portrayed, when Lenny Parker was portraying Da'an, is these very awkward arm movements and body movements that kind of feel robotic and that was on purpose. So it kind of makes me think of like the whole concept of the uncanny valley and how they were introducing these arm movements and these body gestures to make human beings feel more comfortable with them. But it was the way she was portraying these movements was very, very artificial and a bit creepy. But when Da'an was talking and she was using a very monotone language sometimes. She would turn her head or give an eye glance, and a lot was conveyed, especially when she was talking to Boone. It's a really interesting performance because there were other Talons in this series, and they each brought something to the roles that they were playing, but they never quite got the same level that Lenny Parker did. The... I guess analogy I would think of is in Star Trek, there were many people that played Vulcans, but Leonard Nimoy, he had a spin on the Vulcans that I have yet to see anybody match. Even though you had many other Vulcans in all the iterations of Star Trek, they just never quite had that same, I guess, charisma that Leonard Nimoy had. Well, you think about what Leonard Nimoy could communicate just by raising an eyebrow. And that, I I think, is a lot like what Lenny Parker could do, because she seems to be very aware of body language and 
communicating just through subtle movement, which again is something that I think a lot of people don't really have a good grasp of. Because you see a lot of actors these days who are very stiff, very wooden. They read lines, but that's about it. She, on the other hand, she acted with her entire body, which is really saying something because, like you said, she was wearing all those prosthetics and it looked like they had, like, Herman Munster shoulders on her, all the padding she was wearing, and then the boots that she had on, definite platform elevator type boots to make her very tall. The fact that she was able to pull that off and do it well is just downright amazing. Yeah, now that you bring it up, too, that's the one of the few downsides of this series. Is much like we said about Andromeda. The makeup, they were limited at the time of what they could do. So the Talon makeup, although not horrible, it is going to be distracting at first when somebody sees that. I think the greater sin was the costume. Because that, as I said, it really was reminiscent of Herman Munster, especially through the shoulders. Or even the boots. She had like yeah. Herman Munster boots on. Yeah, I, I think that personally, I think that flowing robes probably would have been a better choice. But again, this was like, you know, 25 years ago. So that's neither here nor there at this point. She definitely does better when the camera is showing her from the waist up because you don't see that. Was it purple? That purple sequin, whatever the heck she's wearing. Because that is distracting. It's not... There's no way around ignoring that that costume, in my opinion, distracted from what was going on. And one has to get used to that costume before one can say, okay, what else you got here? And then once you get into the performance, at least for me, the costume is kind of just fades in the background. Yeah, I would describe that costume as like a dark purple sock that's been stuffed and turned into a bodysuit. <laughs> it just it, it did not look good like at all. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. So, to me, Lenny Parker as Daan was one of the highlights of this series, her performance and her character is actually quite interesting because even though they have this commonality where they're all supposed all the Talons are supposed to be kind of working as one She's definitely one of the more independent thinkers of that race. And her protector, Boone, throughout the season one, she trusts him with some knowledge sometimes that she's putting a lot of faith in Boone as far as, you know, she might get in trouble if the rest of the Talons found out some of the stuff that she was pondering, I guess we'll say. This may sound kind of weird, but just go with me for a second. If they had allowed this show to progress as it should have from season one on without killing Boone at the end of the season and without all that weird crap that they did in season two, if they'd allowed season one to continue to progress, it would have been interesting to see just how close that relationship between Daan and Boone would have grown. Especially since there were other Talon who weren't happy with Daan and... I just feel like that relationship between Daan and Boone, they really could have done something interesting with that as far as she is really a non-corporeal entity. He is, obviously, and her having problems with the continuum, and here's this human who is far more trustworthy and supportive. I just, I, I think that there is a lot they could have done with that, but never got a chance to do. They tried in season two and beyond with Boone's replacement, Liam Kincaid, but it could not work because Boone, the whole point on why this worked with Daan, Boone was a fully grown man, a human being that grew up. He was a soldier he was a police officer. He was a husband. He represented humanity. So when he was talking to Daan, there was an exchange of culture between the Talons and the humans. Whereas Liam Kincaid in season two, this was some hybrid space baby that grew up in the course of, I think it an was episode, a few days. An episode, I believe. Yeah, it was one episode, yeah, but yeah. I think it was supposed to be over a few days. Yeah. And there was no way, even though they tried to have that exchange between Liam Kincaid and Daan, that magic that was happening between the races exchanging ideas, you couldn't do it with this character because it was a hybrid space baby. I'll even go as far as to say that I think it also came back to 
you know, Lenny Parker being a very calm actress and character in Da'an, and Kevin Kilner being, again, a very stoic character, very calm presence. That Liam Kincaid character, he did not mesh well with Da'an. The no. vibe was just complete opposites. It felt weird and awkward. I don't know why, if they were going to do what they did, they could have still had that Liam Kincaid character if they wanted to have this character. You could have had him being studied by the Resistance and studied for what genetics he was fusing with. But you had to have some other character. You could not have him exchange with Da'an. And without having that, the whole rest of it fell apart. Because... We mentioned this a bit in our Andromeda video, and we did a little bit more research, but it's really hard to find more details. But I think it's clear something happened big behind the scenes in season one that caused them to retool the series basically from season two on. Every season seemed like it was a different reboot. Again, a lot like Discovery. I don't know exactly what happened, but they had a very magical set up here that could have been something really, really great, like Stargate SG-1 type, we go back and look at it, and instead, most people, when they think of Earth Final Conflict, it's just kind of a joke. Like, yeah, I remember watching that, a bunch of explosions, some iffy CGI, because they're talking about this lasted five seasons. I think that they're talking the stuff that came after that. The same way people who talk about Lost in Space from the 60s talk about Tybo the Carrot. They don't talk about any of the interesting stories that were in black and white in season one. Yeah. So for me, the Boone character, I thought was an interesting setup there because they must have been getting some interesting direction. Because like when Boone was trying to figure out who killed his wife... And because he got that CBI that had its motivational imperative turned off, Lily was pointing out to him, you can't keep pursuing this. The Talons are going to figure out that something's different about you. And the way Boone, his facial expressions changed during some of this dialogue was a very interesting way to communicate ideas. Again, that goes back to what Lenny Parker was doing with Da'an, where facial expressions covered a lot. Like what you mentioned in your synopsis, when Sandoval was trying to lure Boone in to join up by saying, you grieve for your wife, you don't think you can go without her. Hey, you can live in that memory forever if you join us and get one of these CVIs. And you could see on Boone's face, he changed his facial expression, and that really worked on him. That really won him over to strongly considering to do that. There were other side characters that I thought were good, in season one, the one you didn't mention because it didn't really factor in directly was the character Augur. Well, he doesn't show up till episode mm -hmm. two. Mm -hmm. Played by Richard Chavallo. I hope I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. He was an interesting character in season one. And I guess you could say he was a quote unquote hacker, but I kind of look at it more of like he was like a data broker that just, I mean, I'm sure. He probably was a hacker based on what pop culture calls Cyber it. criminal. Yeah. There were some good lines in that second episode where as Boone was meeting with him, because they introduced the Augur character through Boone, and he was asking Lily if she wanted to get in on a uh, financial opportunity that was happening uh, somewhere in Asia the next day. And she's like, well, how do you know that's going to happen? And he's like, well, I'm causing it. There were little lines like that. You could tell this guy was a shady type character and Boone was using him to pull up information about trying to find out who killed his wife. It was great because Augur, it was clear that this guy was extremely intelligent, but at the same time, Boone played to his vanity to manipulate him to get what he wanted. Yep. So at the same time, even though Augur was so smart, he was still malleable because of his giant ego. He was one of my favorite characters. Yeah, in season one. Yeah. Because then later on, there was this episode, Horizon Zero, where these astronauts that were working for NASA were taken off the space project by, you found out the Talons 
requested that they no longer pursue space travel through NASA and that they would offer services through their own shuttle programs. And the astronauts didn't like that because human beings are meant to explore on their own. And so the shuttles have a lock built in that prevent you from leaving the atmosphere of Earth. Through a series of things that happened to that episode, the Resistance got involved with this stolen shuttle, and then Augur was brought in to try to break into the software that the shuttles used and disable that lock. And there was this funny exchange with one of the astronauts where the astronaut was kind of impressed with what Augur was doing, and he said something like, so where did you get your training from? And Augur, like, snorted and said, I trained myself. So that character Augur in season one was a very arrogant yet likable character. And I'm saying season one because like they did with everything else, what they ended up doing after season one is they turned Augur into essentially a... Generic science guy. Yeah, where he... In season one, he was very focused on he was a information broker that dealt with software and software systems. And then they spun him off to be like Mr. Science. Yeah. And they just, to me, they just dulled his character where after season one, I mean, I think in season two, he was a little bit okay still, but they ruined his character pretty quickly. And he was so interesting in season one. And then in season two and beyond, he became boring. And that's the thing, the way he would dress, he was kind of flamboyant with the way he dressed. He kind of reminded me a little bit of Quark from Deep Space Nine, where he had that kind of odd nature to him. It was very Parker Lewis can't lose. Yeah. If you're familiar with that show from the uh, early 90s. He had this like this ponytail in the back and just his whole setup, the glasses he wore. He just was kind of an odd individual to look at. But that was okay because we're dealing with beings made of energy in this show. So Augur was the least weird in the series. So... Augur was a good character, and then the billionaire, Jonathan Doors, that faked his own death, that was an interesting character, too, played by David Hemblin. I remember him. He was in Tech War. Actually, the actor who played Augur was also in Tech War. I'm not going to recommend Tech War, so don't connect these two together other than they were in that series before. Although... The visuals inside Tech War, the computer technology and some of the visual direction from Tech War, it felt familiar in Earth Final Conflict, which makes me wonder if some of the visual artists came from that franchise over to this one. But I didn't get a chance to look to see if anybody did come over. But Jonathan Doors, played by David Hemblin, he portrayed his character like you would expect a billionaire who faked his own death and had his own motivations because the way I was interpreting this is I didn't think that Jonathan Doors was interested in fighting for humanity. I kind of looked at this as, so what happened is when the Talons arrived, somehow they controlled the world's governments. We'll just leave it at that. So I think Jonathan Doors was more interested in forming this resistance, not to fight the good humanity fight. It was personal. Yeah, he's like, look. This government I bought off and I used to run and then these creatures came in and now I don't have control of things anymore and not on my watch that's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. It was clear it was more about him than anything else. Sometimes they would butt heads in the resistance with Jonathan Doors about doing the right thing and the way Jonathan Doors behaved you could tell from an ethics point of view he really didn't care at all about that. No. <laughs> but he was very interesting and then... Lily Marquette, played by Lisa Howard, she was an interesting character as well. She was a, I'm trying to remember, I think she was a marine pilot. She was the one that developed the uh, pilot program for the Talon ships. She was interesting because she had a very straightforward sense of ethics, which played off from her military service, where she was always wanting to do... I suppose, the right thing based on what the mission was. So occasionally she'd butt heads with Jonathan Doors and she'd butt heads with Boone sometimes too. Because for her, it was like, give me the mission, we're going to do the mission. And if you deviate from the mission, what are you doing? That's not the mission. So I think that was a good character as well. And I just want to point out that she was a strong, capable 
female. In 1997. Yeah, yeah. So anyone who says that this didn't exist before now, they don't know what they're talking about. These are people who don't know their history. They're just parroting the common garbage that is being bandied about saying, oh, this is the first woman, whatever. No, it's not. It is so not. You're like 30 years too late to the table here. 40 years if you want to look at things like alien. Sorry, I didn't mean to get worked up there, but that's just something. She was another. She was a very capable, strong female character. Well, Dr. Bellman, who was played by Majel Barrett. That was the next one I wanted to talk about. Like, she... Of course, it's Majel Barrett, and we all know Majel Barrett. Her character was extremely competent. She's the one that reverse-engineered the CBIs to take out the... The Telon imperative. imperative. Yeah. Yeah. She's also the one that faked Jonathan Doerr's death so that he could go underground and do his resistance without being questioned what he was doing. This series had a lot of forward-thinking things. One of my favorite episodes was one titled Through the Looking Glass. And this is one where the Talons, they have this concept of interdimensional travel. And that's kind of like they're faster than light travel. But what they did is they implemented a traveling system on Earth. Kind of like you have airports. Well, they implemented a system where you would step into like these transporter systems. And they would take you through interdimensional and, like, you go from New York to L.A. in, like, two seconds. And the episode itself, I don't want to spoil it in case you haven't watched it, but there was something to do with they were intercepting people mid-transit and stuff was being done to them. And one of those people that had stuff done to them was Boone's sister. And when Boone found out, he was in a predicament because he had to pretend to still be an implant but at the same time protect his sister. And there was a exchange between one of the Talons and him, and it was a very subtle performance, but he was basically asserting, you will not hurt my sister. And the Talon was a bit surprised because he was very calmly asserting that he's not going to allow that to happen. And that was a good episode for a few different reasons. And then Molly mentioned, I think the best episode of the whole season was episode 12, Sandoval's Run. And not only the story, but the performances by the actress who played Sandoval's wife, Dee Dee, and Sandoval himself. Uh, Von Flores. Yeah. Those were some really good performances. In fact, Dee Dee, when she was coming out of the mental institution and she was still drugged up, there was this scene where they were in a hotel and Sandoval was just babbling on about how you know, he's, he's starting to become himself again, blah, blah, blah. And she didn't trust him. So she was just sitting in her wheelchair, just staring at him. And it was really quiet. And it was a really interesting scene when she was just sitting there staring at him while he was just kind of babbling on about the stuff. The scene at the end of this episode that Molly mentioned when Sandoval was being re-implanted and Boone said... I did for you what you once done for me. And then he gave Sandoval the wedding ring, which with the implication was that he killed Sandoval's wife. Sandoval, as he was getting that implant re-implanted, I mean, he was going through an emotional... Oh, he was screaming. Yeah, now. he was screaming. It was yeah. so painful. And then the camera panned up, and then you saw the window where Dee Dee, which was Sandoval's wife, was looking, and she was crying. I just thought those performance through that episode with those two was really, really well done. That's what I miss, is that sort of performances in what they're making now. Something that, it digs something inside of me to feel something. Well, plus it also gave you quite the discussion to have, because Sandoval didn't want to be re-implanted. He wanted to die instead. Boone and the wife decided for Sandoval that he would be re-implanted. I can see both sides of that, because... From Sandoval's standpoint, if he wanted to die instead of becoming that zombie again and doing those horrible things, then uh, that should be his prerogative. However, on the other side, if they didn't reimplant Sandoval, they would have implanted somebody else. They already knew Sandoval. He had made his choice once before and look what it led to. So there were a lot of moral dilemmas to explore with that episode. You don't see a lot of that these days. Plus, we found out in Sandoval's run that Sandoval... He had lots of people committed to this hospital, this yes. mental hospital. Yes. So that's how you know he 
was doing not nice things to people. Yeah. Another concept that I really enjoyed, those weapons that the implants got, those Skrill is what they were called, that was actually a living creature that bonded with the host, the implant. And there was an episode where they were talking like when the implants sleep, they dream with those Skrills. So there was a dialogue about the very primitive dreams that sometimes they can have with the Skrills when the Skrills are dreaming with them. So it's covering that very symbiotic relationship that they had with that creature that was bonded to them. But then it also made you wonder, because it was also in an episode, they were engineering these Skrills, and then you find out that the Talons kind of yanked these Skrills from another planet. And so it's like, well, what are these Talons doing? They seem to... They put their hands out like they're helping, but then you find out little pieces that make you wonder, well, what are you helping and who are you helping? Yeah, because the whole Skrill thing at first, it's kind of like, you know, is this like a uh, a symbiont situation like from Star Trek? But then, like you said, you find out that they actually were stolen from their planet and being engineered and produced by the Talon. And, and then it takes on this whole other ick factor of how they're exploiting these creatures. And if they're doing this to the Skrill, what do you think they're going to do to us kind of thing? Well, and, and that's the point is the big mystery here is, well, why are the Talons here? Yes. Jonathan Dorr is even saying, well, why are they here? Mm -hmm. I don't believe they're here to cure sickness and to give us limitless energy and just to be nice people out there there's some other thing going on here and the more this goes on the more you realize there's something else going on there it also becomes clear that whatever that is Don's not really on board with it because there's little pieces of dialogue when she talks the the ruling body of the Talons I think is called the Synod and they have exchanges in their energy forms where Daan's not always getting on board with what the Synod wants to do, which they had an episode that was set in Ireland where you found out that hundreds of years ago, I think possibly thousands, a Talon explorer came to Earth and was evaluating human beings for some reason. In the episode, they were trying to get that data from that explorer, but it wasn't really clear what exactly what the mission was, but it had to do a lot with whether the Talons were going to come here or not for some reason. And I think every episode, there are, uh, there's like three episodes in this 21 or 22 episode season that I'm like, eh, I mean, they're not bad, but they're not great. But that leaves like 18, 19 episodes that I really enjoyed. I really am sad Whatever happened behind the scenes with this show, they ruined something, I think, made this franchise at, you know, be similar to like we remember Stargate SG-1, where people remember SG-1, they go back and rewatch it, and I think this could have been that, something like that. It's not. I cannot state this strongly enough. I do not like season two and beyond. I find the series to be garbage at that point. I think it's telling that the only main character who made it all five seasons was Von Flores playing Sandoval. Everybody else left. And he also was in Tech War too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, so when your entire main cast is either let go or jumps ship, Something's wrong there, well, and it's not them. It's it's the, the show. Throughout the whole series, even when the seasons I didn't like, they were still turning over main characters. Yeah. It's like somehow these actors wanted to get away from this production. Yeah. They would stay on for a season or two and then get the heck out. So something must have been happening at this production that could not keep people to keep working on it. Yeah, and you know maybe if social media had existed back then as it does now... We might have found out that it was some sort of situation like we saw with some of that Kurtzman trek where it turns out that showrunners were being abusive. That's entirely possible. Uh, I'm not stating that that's what happened because we, we really don't know. But clearly something was wrong there and it, it wasn't the actors. 
there was something else going on. I don't know if it was the, the money behind the thing, wanting to include more sex and explosions, and it, the current characters weren't which, sexy enough. Which you did get, by the way, coincidentally, there was lots more explosions and skin shown in later seasons. Well, that's how they ruined Sequest, too. I mean, yeah. like, you know, the suits ruined Sequest. Yeah, not, not that there's any other relationship between the two shows, other than they were both ruined by trying to hunkify season two and beyond. Yeah, that one we know, because for Sequest, we have an article where they talk about the direction for season two they wanted to go. They wanted to hunkify. And hunkify is actually what... In the article. Yep. Oh. Ugh, so yeah. I have a feeling something like that was here. They were... They had a core audience, and then the core audience wasn't large enough for them, so they expanded it out to try to bring in more normies, and by expanding it out for normies, they ruined it. And that's a shame. We have so many shows that we could make a video about of where they did just that thing. I understand these shows take money to make, and you want to maximize profit, but at some point, you've got to factor art versus profit and figure out where that balance act is. And they seem to, in the past, they always fall on the line of let's make money and screw the art. Yeah. So my recommendation for this series is extremely high for season one. You're going to have to get past the costuming of the Talons the Herman Munster outfit, as Molly calls it. And there are some, I'm not going to say dodgy CGI, but early CGI. Like, it was 1997. Like Lily in the shuttle when she's landing, and you can see the outline of her piloting, and it looks like a static CGI mannequin in the shuttle. So there's going to be things like that that are going to be like, okay. But I feel that season one has a lot going for it. I'll, I'll do one more, because we talked about this in one of our reviews for Discovery, is you find out between an exchange between Da'an and Boone that the Talons, their written word is in three dimensions. And so you can't just read it left to right or right to left like you do on Earth. There is some other way to tie these things together and... Da'an described it as you kind of have to feel what the language is trying to direct you to the next letter, I guess we'll say, or next word. It's interesting. Obviously, this isn't like a pheromone thing, but it's interesting how much the Talon seem to have in common with Species 10C from Season 4 of Discovery. Yeah, we even, I'm, I'm just saying. We even talked about that. Yeah. So that language idea I thought was interesting and I think that would have been explored in season two. There were so many little things that were brought up like that, that I really wish we could have had a proper season two, because the slow burn of season one, it constructed this world and its world building season that I wanted to see a lot more of. And then they crashed it in season two, the first episode. It was like they took everything interesting from season one, all the questions that they'd set up, and they just threw them out the window. It was it was a reboot. Season two was a reboot. It was not the same show anymore. You had a couple of the same faces, but I think of it, I mean, the best you can say is like a spin-off series. Yeah. Like Baywatch Nights was to Baywatch. It's just some spin-off that's not that Baywatch was the pinnacle of anything, but Baywatch <laughs> Nights was like worse than Baywatch. My recommendation is if you've only seen Earth Final Conflict and you've only seen the latter seasons you miss the show at its best. So I would recommend going back to season one and watching it, but stop at that last episode, which has problems, by the way. You can see some signs that it was going to go a bad direction, but stop at episode 22 of season one and do not go any further. And understand that there are going to be questions that aren't answered. Lots of questions. Yeah, yeah. So you're getting an incomplete story when you watch it, but at least you'll have one season where you're actually thinking about things and it's setting up interesting concepts. And it's more of an exercise in, I guess, just thought, <laughs> uh, if that makes sense to people. All of this was... Like, there was an episode where you found out that the Talons were trying to implant criminals to try to reform criminals. And 
that kind of went wrong. But these little concepts that they bring up in every little corner of every episode that I find to be why I like watching science fiction for exploring those ideas. Well, yeah, they were ethical dilemmas that actually made you think. That's what season one does. There is a bit of action in it. I'm not going to say there's not. But there is a lot of interesting science fiction ideas that are built and I wanted to see it continue because they built a really strong foundation, especially in the first half of season one. The second half of season one kind of got a bit sketchy, but then I, whatever was happening behind the scenes, I kind of think that that was related. Yeah. So season one toward the mid to end gets a bit sketchy, but I'm still going to say there's some good stuff in there. And I would recommend this. The season one of this show, to me... I put up there with some of the stories from Babylon 5. I put up there with some of the stories from Deep Space Nine. I put up there with Space Above and Beyond. Production standards aside, the stories and the concepts are up there with the best the 90s had to offer. And it's a shame that this series, because of what came after season one, that stuff's forgotten. It's like you're pushing dirt over some really good stuff. I normally don't like the ideas of reboots because I feel once a story's been told, it's pointless to tell it again. But because this got mucked up so bad, this would be one of the few things that I would be okay with a reboot if the reboot's going to be done correctly. Yeah, if they go ahead and start with the original premise and work off of season one and go in the direction it should have gone. Because this is a shame. I mean, I'm... Excited to recommend season one to you, but at the same time, it saddens me because whatever happened in season two, three, four, and five, they do flesh out what the mission was of the Talons and this other stuff. They try to fill in the mysteries, but now I question, is that even what was originally intended? So all that stuff, I just, at the end of season one, I'm like, yep, they didn't finish. It's like you found some unfinished work or... Kind of like if, if those of us who remember Firefly, who only got one season, I just think of Earth Final Conflict Season 1 like it's Firefly, where they started something really interesting, and then they ran on a runway and it stopped. And that's how I think of this, this Season 1 of Earth Final Conflict is like a, a Firefly or even Space Above and Beyond, because there's another Season 1 show that one day I hope we can do a review on that, because that's another one of those hidden treasures that I don't think a lot of people know about. Agreed. So, my take, I am strongly recommending Season 1 with the small caveat of, like we did for Andromeda, you're going to get some iffy costuming and you're going to get some iffy CGI, but I think there's a lot here. Like, I'm recommending Season 1 of Earth Final Conflict pretty highly. Now, that could just be because I like exploring those concepts they brought up, which they never finished, but that might be just... I'm a sucker for that sort of stuff. That's the science fiction that I like. And I thought they'd build an interesting world. If somebody wasn't biased like that, I don't know if they would like season one as much as I do. But I am giving a very high recommendation for season one. Pretty much three quarters of the episode of season one, are, I think, are really interesting episodes. I would agree. Well, that being said, I would like to, again, thank everybody who has listened this far. If you have listened this far and you're not subscribed, I would ask you to please hit that subscribe button. We are now, as of this recording, at 868 subscribers. So again, we're working toward that 1,000 goal so that we can apply for monetization and see if maybe we can't get a little bit of grocery money going on here for all the hard work we put in. That was Earth Final Conflict. Season one, totally recommend. Anything beyond that, don't watch it. <laughs> I guess we've got one more week to go without Star Trek Discovery, and then on April 4th, the new season drops. So we will be uh, reviewing that show thereafter. And until then, take care.